So, um, as it was mentioned in the other talks here, uh, the, my curiosity is the driving force for, for this uh, topic. By the way, uh, you see the Curiosity rover on Mars there. Uh, Martin Rees also showed a picture of it. Um, this is a selfie. <laughs> now that we live in, this, in the age of selfies, uh, and the Holy Father said yesterday, this is another motivation for, for my talk, that to the scientists, and especially to the Christian scientist, I'm a Christian scientist, though I'm a Jesuit scientist, but I'm also Christian, corresponds to the attitude to examine the future of humanity and the earth, and I would add, and of the universe. Uh, that's the reason for uh, trying to study and present you this topic. So if we could quote the universe, the universe would say, in my beginning is my end. Because in the sense, in the initial conditions, it's written the end of the universe. In fact, this is the universe, but the universe living in T.S. Eliot, who is uh, the author of this quote. Uh, scientists ask ourselves, where are we, where did we come from, where are we going? Um, fortunately, we are not the only human beings to ask these questions. And for example, Paul Gauguin, with this painting titled, Where are we, where did we come from, where are we going? is asking the same question. So there are different approaches uh, to these uh, fundamental questions. I'm not going to discuss the, the painting because I'm not an art, fine art crit critic. Uh, so, uh, we can only think the past and the future of the universe from the, its presence and from the data that we have collected and interpreted. We test our ideas with a reality check. In my talk, I won't discuss uh, any biological or technical evolution. So we are species with uh, long eyes, uh, and Galileo Galilei is our forefather uh, of these people with the long eyes. I just wanted to show you this telescope, uh, the VAT, the Vatican Advanced Telescope. Telescope is a uh, Mount Graham in Arizona. It is in collaboration with the University of Arizona. A small telescope is a 1.8 meter. Uh, this was the test bed for the large binocular telescope, two, teles two meters uh, with a diameter of 8.40 centimeters. And this is one Gemini's uh, two telescope of eight meter diameter in Chile and in Hawaii. And this is a project, uh, the a European project, the European Extreme Large Telescope. The size of the mirror is supposed to be around 40 meters. And astronomers are like uh, children. We want to have uh, big toys to do our research. And these telescopes are meant to answer the questions that Pierre Lenau were posing about the, for example, the atmosphere and other exoplanets. So uh, what we can say about the beginning, uh, there are experimental data confirming the Big Bang, which are the expansion of the universe, the Hubble's law, the cosmic background radiation, the, and also that the Big Bang theory correctly predicts the cosmic abundance of hydrogen, helium, and other light elements. I'm not going to discuss this. Uh, in 2009, the, pro, the Nobel Prize in Physics uh, was awarded to two teams uh, doing research on supernovae, uh, leading by Brian Smith and Adam Rees, one of the team, and Sol Permuter, the other one. The observations of very distant supernovas prove that we live uh, in a universe uh, which is expanding and acceler accelerated in the expansion. Recent 
observations done by the European mission Planck uh, tell us that the universe is made up of about four or five percent of uh, baryonic matter, ordinary matter, uh, 68.3 percent dark energy, and 20, about 27 percent dark matter. These are the recent results that um, confirm that the age of the universe is about 14 billion years. Uh, in March, there was this uh, published this uh, result on the detection of gravitational waves by the BICIP2 experiment at the South Pole, supporting the idea that there was inflation at the beginning of the universe. Uh, this result has been discussed, uh, probably they will be confirmed. But again, this is another proof, experimental proof of the Big Bang theory, and particularly in this case of the inflation of the universe. Uh, so these are the different possible solutions to the equations, the field equations. And here is our present, this is what we can see from the universe. And this is toward the past. We can learn as far as the background radiation. And we can know, of course, about the, the future. We don't have information coming from the future. And as much as we know with the data that we have, we can say that we live in an accelerating universe. If we use this idea by Carl Sagan uh, of comparing the age of the universe with the calendar year, in this uh, one cosmic year is about 14 billion years. Uh, and if the Big Bang happened in January the 1st, we are living uh, in the last second of the last instant of uh, the December the 31st. So going to the future, the future is very difficult to make prediction, especially about the future. So the only thing we, <laughs> you got it. <laughs> uh, the predictions depend on the time scale that we choose to analyze this. Um, so I will start with the, with the Earth. Um, there are many factors here. Uh, I, we should take into account earthquakes, volcanic activities, changes in the core, solar activities, continental drift, ice ages. What I, I want to say is that the, the image of the Earth in three billion years, about 0.2 cosmic years, is a declining world. In eight billion years, uh, the sun will become a red giant expanding to the present orbit of the Earth. The, sun's, the sun expands, will expel a considerable part of the mass into the space. The, the sun will become a red giant uh, and then will lose the external layers. And when the sun expands to the current orbit of the Earth, which is uh, one astronomical unit, about 150 a million kilometers, uh, the Earth itself will have moved to almost twice its current distance from the Sun. Uh, the other topic that I will, go to I will discuss regarding the Earth are the, the impact and the threat of near-Earth objects. Uh, here, in this plot, uh, you have the frequency of uh, impactors, objects that may impact the Earth, and here the size. Uh, the crater produced by the impactor is uh, around 10 times larger than the impactor, the object, and you will see here the consequences. For example, for one meter object, uh, there is uh, almost one every hour hitting the Earth, or Maybe it's not uh, going through the atmosphere. Uh, a hundred meter object will produce an atmospheric uh, explosion uh, or a small crater. 
uh, an object of the order of one kilometer uh, will produce tsunamis, uh, widespread devastation, climate change. And an object of about 10 kilometers can produce mass, mass extinction, like uh, the one happened 65 million years ago in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, let me show you these videos. This is uh, in Shelabinsk, uh, Russia. This is the impact of uh, that, I mean, make the, the news around the world. This is not science fiction, I guess. This <laughs> And here, uh, there is a simulation of the comet, the, uh, comet uh, Shoemaker-Levy hitting the, let me see. The comet uh, had about three, 13 fragments. And you see here the impact, the, uh, of the object, this, the size of this impact are around the diameter of the Earth. So what we can say about the, the end of the sun, uh, this is the period is one cosmic year, uh, around 40 billion years. This is the present for the sun and uh, you know, the evolution of stars, or, or to be precise, as um, Martin Rees suggested, the development of stars depends on the, their mass. Basically, a mass as our sun will develop like this. Now we are at the, uh, the present, and at the end, I mean, in around uh, six, uh, billion years, the sun will become a red giant, and then a planetary nebula, and there will be a white dwarf. Uh, the, the sun will become a, a, a white dwarf. When the, the sun will become a red giant, the diameter of the sun will be around two astronomical units. And see, you see here the size of the sun compared with the red giant. So there is a stellar evolution, as I, I already said, or stellar development. And stars can uh, evolve to a white dwarf, uh, or they can become exploding in supernova, and then at the end will become or a, a, neutron, a, star, a neutron star or a black hole. So another threat for the, for the Earth, if we survive, may be a supernova. Any supernova that occurs within 100, 200 light years of the sun is likely to have a notice, noticeable effect on the solar system. Uh, our galaxy, uh, the sun rotates around the center of the galaxy, where there is, as uh, Pierre said already, a supermassive black hole of the order, if I'm not wrong, four uh, billion solar masses. The period of the rotation of the sun around the center of the galaxy is about uh, uh, 200, and I was, I had the number, 200, well, 200 million light years, and the distance from the sun to the center of the galaxy is about 26, 28,000 light years. So one galactic year is about, uh, 0.01 cosmic year. We need also to take into account the, the recycling of stars, uh, gas and stars. Uh, stars form in the clouds of first at atomic uh, hydrogen, then they become molecular clouds when they get cold enough. Then they form stars, uh, supernovae, and the products of the stars uh, return to the, to the environment. And then a new generation of stars uh, will form. 
galaxies, uh, we know that galaxies are living clusters of galaxies. Um, and I would like to show you, again, another video. It's a simulation of the evolution in a, um, it's very difficult not to talk about cosmic evolution or galaxy evolution because we are used to, to use those terms in astrophysics. You see uh, how galaxies interact. Uh, Martin C. Rees mentioned that Andromeda and our Milky Way uh, will merge. And this is what is happening in the center of the cluster where a giant elliptical galaxy is forming. So the scale, again, of this process is about the age of the universe, 14 billion years. We also need to take into account the cosmic star formation rate in the universe. We have the star formation rate density and along uh, versus the age of the universe or the redshift. Uh, the universe, the, the moment of the universe when it produced most of the star was uh, about 10 billion years ago. Uh, and so this is another important factor that we need to consider when we, we study or we want to say something about the evolution of uh, galaxies. So what would be the end of the galaxies in uh, around trillions and trillions of years, around 10 to the 90 cosmic years, galaxies will fade into the darkness. Cluster of galaxies will become clusters of black holes. And finally, uh, black holes will evaporate. So uh, we are almost near the end of the universe. Uh, <laughs> Only in 15 minutes, I did it well. Uh, in a very distant future of the universe, eventually, the universe will be shredded. It's called the Big Rip. The universe could not have a single final end, but the multiple end. The universe is going toward a final state of cold and darkness, thermal death which says that the universe will go forward a state of maximum entropy, which is called the big uh, freeze. And the long-term scenario with everything in the universe gradually dying is obviously hostile to life. So going back again to T.S. Eliot, this is the way the world ends, this is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. Not with the bang, but the wi a whimper. This is uh, very poetic, but not very nice, I guess. Uh, so I can tell you that preparing this talk was a kind of a spiritual, a spiritual experience, in the sense that uh, what uh, Nietzsche uh, says here, when you look long into the abyss, the abyss looks into you. Or, Walton Coelet, uh, in the Ecclesiastes, in the Bible, a vast emptiness, Coelet says, an immense void, everything is empty. So I, at this point, when I arrived to this point, I felt a little bit of this emptiness, darkness, if you want, because uh, thinking about the end of the Earth and the end of the universe makes you reflect on your own end. And this is not easy for everyone. I mean, I think it's... So, I ask myself, is this the last word? Until here is what the, I can say from scientific knowledge that more or less can be shared or not. There are many things that maybe I need to review, but basically this is it. And I thought like in the movies or in the TV films, uh, I thought that for a moment 
this story can be continued. So one experience that I think all of us has is that um, life is resilient. Especially you that are biologists know quite well this. Uh, I'm not a biologist, so, so uh, forgive me if I make a mistake. But this is called an extremophile. This is a little creature that is called, I don't know, I don't remember the technical term for it, but it's called a water bear that uh, lives in very extreme condition, almost, it can live in temperature like a, almost close to the absolute zero, and living almost to conditions uh, where the water can boil. This is about one millimeter, 0.5 millimeter, and it can live for 10 years without food and without water. This is Castel Gandolfo. I don't know if uh, some of you have visited the Papal Gardens. These are the ruins of the Papal, the, not the Papal, the, the, the Emperor Domitian. This used to be his palace. There is uh, no human life there. Human life there disappeared. But again, I don't know if you can see, maybe not from here in the picture, but there is a tree, or several trees. Living trees where there is no human beings for many centuries. I would like to, about the extraterrestrial life, um, I would like to quote uh, Father Secchi. Father Secchi was uh, one of the fathers of astrophysics. He was also a Jesuit. Now it is perfect, uh, even the Pope. Uh, so he says that in, in one of his books. And I, I divide in astrophysics, biology, and theology fiction, I call it. What to think of these stars without any doubt similar to our sun, destined like the sun to keep alive an enormous quantity of creatures of every kind. This is called, what we call today astrobiology. And then there is a reference to theology, but as I say, until we don't have a proof of extraterrestrial life, we cannot ask questions, this is my position, real questions about theology. In any case, Father Seki said, those immense regions must, must be inhabited by intelligent beings endowed with reason, capable to know, love, and honor the Creator. And perhaps these inhabitants of the stars are more faithful than us to the duties of acknowledgement towards who draw them from nothing. We want to hope that among them there are not those unlucky within their pride deny the existence of the Creator. You know, sometimes I have said these things and made the headlines of papers, but you know, there is nothing new quoting again, quite Father Secchi already said these things more than 100 years ago. And I also would like to quote Martin Rees, though I mentioned to him that I was going to quote him from his book, The Final Hour. He says, the wider cosmos has a potential future that could even be infinite. But will these vast expanses of time be filled with life, or as empty as the earth, first sterile, sterile seas? The choice may depend on us this century. So we might, this is. And also, he says, the most crucial location in space and time, apart from the Big Bang itself, could be there and now. Another possibility for the future of the universe uh, would be the M theory, uh, which is a kind of unified vision of uh, super theories. I think it was uh, Edward 
forbidden that the proposed and member of the academy propose these ideas. Among them, uh, a coalition of two membranes uh, can produce uh, another Big Bang. So there may be also life in other universes. I'm coming to the end, and I would also like to quote uh, Pope Francis giving an address to the uh, Pontifical Gregorian University, the Jesuit University in Rome. The Pope said, the theologian who is satisfied with this complete and conclusive thought is mediocre. The good theologian and philosopher has an open, that is, an incomplete thought always open to the minds of God and of the truth, always in development. I'm paraphrasing Pope Francis, I replace scientists, and I don't mention God, I believe in God, but I don't mention God here. The scientist who is satisfied with the, his or her complete and conclusive thought is a mediocre. The good scientist has op an open that is an incomplete thought, always open to the minds of the truth, always in development. Uh, so there are uh, incomplete matters. Uh, first, I, I, I wrote, we don't know about the origin and definition of life. Probably it would be better to say we don't agree on what is intelligent life. And we don't agree, I, again, I should have written here, on the definition of civilization. We don't know about dark matter and dark energy in the sense we know what they can produce, but we don't know the, or the evidences for them, but we don't know the nature. We need a, still a theory of everything, the combination of general relativity and quantum mechanics and the standard model. And of course, this, is, this list is incomplete. And finally, I would like to quote Joseph Ratzinger, a member of this academy, in his book, this is my translation from Italian, but uh, his book, uh, Introduction to Christianity, and it's about, I would say, I have tried to present a scientific view of the end of the universe, and this can help us to see what is on the other side, the side from the theology. Christian realism goes beyond the physical as realism of the Holy Spirit. Is if the cosmos is history, and if matter represents a moment in the history of the spirit, then matter and spirit are not forever next to each other in a neutral manner. It is necessary to consider one last complexity in which the world finds its omega and unity. Then there is one last link between matter and spirit in which the destiny of man and the world finds compliance. Even if today we cannot define the type of such connection, then the last day is one in which the fate of each man will be fulfilled because the fate of humanity, and I would add, of the, and the universe, has found fulfillment. Thank you very much. <laughs>